started. Let's open up in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you for each one here. Um, Father, we ask you to prepare our hearts to hear your word and to uh, help us to understand your, your design and your purpose for your church and our place in it. Father, I pray that this class would help us to understand um, what it means to be the church and what it means to be your church. I pray that we may um, uh, live our lives in, uh, in according to your will and uh, in function in the church. Father. So just, uh, again, just give us uh, minds to understand and hearts willing to be obedient to your word today. For your Holy Spirit to be in this place, Father. Speak to us according to your will. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, welcome everybody. And, uh, this is a class with a very fancy name, but the, the, the subject matter is not as complicated as you might think. <coughs> Practical ecclesiology just means ecclesiology just means the study of the church. Um, and when I do a class, <clears throat> um, I do a class called Basic Theology. And we go through the ten doctrines, the ten cardinal doctrines of the church. And ecclesiology is one of them. We just do it in one class. Well, this is taking that class and expanding it across eight classes. So we're just going to we're going to um, study the church. Now, the point of it being practical ecclesiology is that I want the emphasis on this class <coughs> to be uh, on the practical end of it. You know, the first couple of classes we're just going to be learning some stuff, but then we're going to talk about we're going to get into the practical application of the church, you know, the purposes, the activities, the things that, that <clears throat> help us understand, you know, why we do the things we do, and what our role, more importantly, what our role in the church is supposed to be. So that's why it's practical ecclesiology. <clears throat> I've given you a course schedule, um, and you can see the different classes that we're going to have. We are going to be taking a week off on February 18th, because, um, Myself and a lot of us are going to be out of town up in Merritt Island at uh, a pastor's conference, so I won't be here. <clears throat> um, so it'll be over the span of nine weeks, we'll have all eight classes. And just running down, like tonight, we're going to start with the nature of the church. We're going to get into the definition, origin, Christ's work, pictures, attributes about the church. Uh, next week, we are going to do um, the history of the church. Pentecost to present in one class. So don't you know, don't expect to get anything comprehensive out of it. It's meant to be sort of a broad brush. I do. It's another class that I do. Uh, again, eight weeks um, and uh, covering the, the history of the church. And there's a, there's a lot to cover. So we're not going to be comprehensive. We're just going to be. And, in order, and actually, what I've done is, <coughs> um, in order to try to abbreviate it, and. Our classes are generally going to be about an hour long. I'm going to try to keep it in that in that time frame tonight. We might go a little long because we're sort of doing some housekeeping stuff here. <coughs> um, but um, we're going to do the entire history of the church in one week by looking at the seven churches in Asia from the Book of Revelation. And if you were if you were in my church history class or in the Revelation Daniel class, you know that I sort of draw a, uh, a parallel between the seven churches uh, addressed in Asia in, in the book of Revelation, chapters 2 through two and 3, uh, to church history because it's an interesting thing. You can sort of overlay them across church history and, and get a neat picture, and that will help me to just sort of uh, summarize things as we go through it. <clears throat> so that's history of the church next week. Then we're going to have two classes on the purposes of the church, what the church, why the church exists. Um, then we're going to have our week off, come back, the structure of the church. We're going to talk about leadership, 
ordinances, offices, polity. Polity just means governance, gov the government of <coughs> the church. Uh, discipline and different activities in the church. Uh, church and community. And we're going to be talking about both community of the church, within the church, what I call body life. <coughs> um, taking it out into our community, our business, our, our home, um, social justice, so is there our social um, um, encounters, things like that. Uh, then we're going to talk about the Holy Spirit and the role of the Holy Spirit. We're going to talk about the gifts. We're going to talk about uh, him being the restrainer and what the, what the um, we read about the removal of the restrainer and what that how that relates to the Holy Spirit and the church. And then we're going to end up in the last class with a conclusion talking about the rapture, the tribulation, the millennium, millennium uh, and um, the, the bride coming down. So we'll be looking a little bit into eschatology in the last one and the church's role in the future. So, uh, as always, these classes are um, open classes in that if you have a question, just shoot up your hand. Don't, you know, if, if don't feel you're interrupting me. If, if I need to get finished the thought, I'll finish the thought and then I'll get to you, you know, or whatever. I may just call on you right away. If you got a question, you don't understand something I said, or you just have something to add. I mean, I don't want to get carried away too far on rabbit trails because we've got to get things done but um, but I want if you have a question I want you to feel free to just shoot up your hand and, and you know we can talk about things so uh, I, I really would like to see this um, this class sort of stir up some, some discussion and some conversation so so we are going to get started All right, so to start off, we've got this, this sort of diagram up here, and, um, and again, I will be placing, I, we're recording the class, uh, I put it on the website, uh, I will uh, probably next week, I forgot, well, I'm going to do it this week, take the back of this, uh, before you leave, I need to get, well, maybe we'll just pass it around, I need to get everybody's name and email address, okay? If, if you're a couple, I just need one of you. I don't need both email addresses. Uh, but it's just so that what I will do is after, like, I'm going to record it tonight, either tomorrow or Wednesday, I'll send out an email with a link. So you can go to the YouTube video. Uh, you can watch the class if you want to. Um, and if you miss a class, you'll still get that email and you'll be able to, to watch the class. You can also just go to our website, go to the calendar, find Calvary Classroom on the calendar. And when you click on it, it'll take you right to this page. It'll have all our links. It'll have all the, um, the PowerPoint presentations and any handouts that I give. They'll be on there as well, as well as links to the YouTube video. So <clears throat> feel free to take advantage of that. So I got this great little diagram up here. Because as we go through this, uh, <clears throat> We're going to go through a lot of scripture. This is the doctrine of the church according to the scriptures. But we're also going to be looking at things that are, uh, we'll just say, extra biblical. Uh, and not in the sense that they are uh, contrary to the Bible, but they're, you know, God is, um, is so creative that in his scripture, he has intentionally left some things out for us to sort of um, listen to the Holy Spirit. Because if God just put, okay, do this this way, and this this way, and this way, and then, and then for five minutes do this, and then for ten minutes, you, you know, God says, no, I'm gonna, we're going to talk about things in general principles, in general uh, understanding of, of, of uh, what my prescriptions are for you, but I'm going to leave some things open for you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and the leading of the Holy Spirit to do it. So, over the course of 2,000 plus years, uh, we have sort of lenses that we look through. As we form a, as anybody will form a philosophy of ministry for, the, for a church, okay, the, as, it, as it says here, um, 
<coughs> form, pattern, structure, organization, method, tradition. And that's not as, as dry and mundane as it, as it sounds. That just sounds like, oh, this is boring stuff you do at church. It's, you know, it's, it's this one author, and these are the two books that I used in preparation, majority. Uh, one is called Sharpening the Focus of the Church by Gene Getz. Um, Tony commented on how old this book was. I said, thank you. It was brand new when I got it in Bible college. <laughs> <laughs> now it's all yellowing and, you know. Um, and, uh, and then this, I have it on this because I have it as a Kindle on my, on my tablet. It's called The Church by Mark Deaver. Uh, the Gospel Made Visible. These are the two books. But one of the things that Gene Getz says, he says, he says, where there are people, there's going to be structure. And there's, where there's structure, there's going to be form. In other words, whenever people gather together, they're going to they're gonna say, what are we doing? We need structure. We want to know what we're doing. Okay? Once you figure out what you're doing, then let's see how we're going to do it. Right? I mean, we came here to together. What are we doing? Well, we're sitting down. We're going to listen, we're going to, listen to a class. How are we going to do it? Well, we've got the seats arranged in such and such a way. I'm going to get up here and speak. I let you guys know it's okay for you to, to respond back. And, you know, we need structure and form in order to function, in order to do things. So, uh, in order to get to that place where we have a functioning church, and this class, when we get to it in a minute, we're not just talking about this church. We're not just talking about a single church. We're talking about the church we're going to see in three different ways. But in order to have a functioning church, okay, we, we develop a philosophy of ministry. Where does that philosophy of ministry come from? Well, the primary lens that we look through is Scripture. Okay, the, that is going to give us our, our directives and our functions. What are we supposed to do? Right? And, and the Bible tells us, and this is the primary lens. Everything else needs to, needs to go through this first. Uh, the, the, the scripture is where we begin when we are trying to develop or understand the church and develop a philosophy of ministry. It begins in the scripture and it is tethered to the scripture. We don't go uh, um, contrary to the scripture. Uh, but there are other lenses. There is the lens of history. Events and it mean it can mean church history. We look back and we see some of the different things that the church fathers did and different men through history, and we can use see them as an example and uh, some of the things that they did and and changes that they made. You know, when we look at the church, it's difficult to look at the at, at the the function and the the process that we see in the church today without considering a man like Martin Luther. Right? We have to look through the lens of history. It, it colors, these lenses color the way that we develop our philosophy of ministry. Okay, uh, and then the last one is culture. And that is situation, that is observations. Um, how people think. You know, you can do certain things in ministry in one place, you can't do it someplace else. You, um, you know, I gave this example to Tony uh, the other day. When the Wycliffe um, <clears throat> translators were down somewhere in South America with an indigenous tribe down there, and they were translating the Bible into their language. They were translating that, that verse in, um, in Revelation 3 when it says, Jesus it says, Jesus is saying, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And the people were getting very offended by that. They were very disturbed by, by that phrase. And they looked into it and they found out that these people in that culture, if you go to a person's home, hut, whatever it is, and you knock, that's what thieves do. Thieves knock and then hide. They see if somebody comes to the door wondering what's going on. And if nobody comes to the door, then they go in the house and they steal everything. Friends, when a friend comes to your house, he doesn't knock, he calls. Well, the, the Wycliffe translators said, look, we, wanna, we, want, we don't want to change the scripture and pervert it, but we want to make sure that we're sensitive to their culture. So they changed it to, behold, I stand at the door and call. Being sensitive to the culture. 
That's just an example of being sensitive to the culture. And just as we develop our, you know, church is going to look very different in North America than it does in Ghana. And I, but that I can, I can attest to because we had some, some folks from Ghana come to our church one time, not this church, another church. And they came, and it was a blast because they came, their worship, they were running around the stage with scarves in their hands and they're, you know, dancing and it was, and that's what they do and that's how they worship and that works for them and that's great. We can't do that every week. It's just not, you know. And it's just not going to fit our culture. People are going to say, what kind of church is this? This is weird. So, you know, so everything we, we develop a philosophy of ministry and as we look at the church and look at the things that we're, that we're going to be discussing in this class, we're going to be going through these three lenses. And not that we're going to be talking a lot about these lenses, but I just, I want that to sort of be the, the sort of an underpinning as we look at all these things, um, that, that these, these are all factors that color our philosophy and our approach to ministry in the church. All that being said, we don't let either of these two supersede this. The lens of Scripture is the primary lens that we see anything through. That's the, that's the final authority. Everything else can, can affect shades and, and viewpoints and, and, you know, and subtle, uh, subtleties and things like that, but they don't change the basis of what we're talking about in Scripture. So, we're going to start off with the origin of the church. And if you have your Bible, you can turn to Matthew 16. Familiar verse. I think it's important for us to go ahead and read it. Matthew 16. Verse 18. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. And that is the first place in the scripture where the word church is used. And when, when Jesus says, you are Peter, and upon this rock, and we probably all heard this, um, He's not talking about Peter. You know, he, Jesus was sort of making a play on words because he would call him Peter, which means a stone. You know, a little stone, something that, you know, that you would hold in your hand. And, and he says, yeah, you're Peter, you're a stone, but upon this boulder, and the boulder that he's talking about, that word rock, it's, and there are two different words there when he says Peter and, and rock. But they sound like one is uh, Petra and one is Petros. Uh, and one means a one you can hold in your hand, another one means a, means a boulder. The boulder that he is going to build the church upon is this confession of Peter. And what is the confession that Peter makes? He says, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's the bold, that's the foundation that the church is built upon. So that's why when we talk about the church, we're talking about the church that, that is on that confession. If, if the church, whatever church it is, whatever thing calls itself a church, if they do not believe that he is the Christ, the son of the living God, that's not the church. Okay, that, because that's the very first foundational point of anything being qualifying as the church. Um, turn to Ephesians 2. Since we're talking about foundation. So you talked to Bob here tonight. He made it. He was Dr. Bob, I'm watching on online. He kept asking me if I was going to be in Ephesians 2, and I said, yeah, I'll be there. So Ephesians 2. Verses 19 to 22. Now therefore you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, having been built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom the whole building 
being fitted together, grows into the holy temple in the Lord, in whom you are also being built together for a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. So that's the, you know, the foundation of the church. Is this almost a, a definition of what the church is? And um, when, when we talk about the church, there's, there's, in the scripture, the word that, that comes up is uh, the word ecclesia. It's used for the church. There's a few words I want to look at. Uh, ecclesia comes from two Greek words, ek, out, and kaleo, which means called. So the called out ones. This is the word that Jesus used. It's the first time the word ecclesia is used in the scripture. I mean, well, in the New, yeah, New Testament. Um, and it's in uh, Matthew 16. Okay, when he talks about the church. The first mention of the church and use of the word ecclesia. A called out means. That's literally what it means. Now, it was a word that was used in secular terminology as well. I mean, Jesus didn't invent the word. It wasn't the first time they had ever heard that word. The first time they had ever heard it referred to in a spiritual sense. The ecclesia was like the town meeting. When the people, when the town elders were called out to come gather together, that was the ecclesia. It was like the town council. Now, a similar word that we see is synagogue, which is the synagogue which comes from um, uh, two words in the Greek, soon and go, which means uh, to lead together. Soon means together, and it's actually, it's uh, ago, which means uh, to lead. So to lead together or to, to, um, to gather together, to lead out uh, into a place and gather together. And that was the synagogue where the Jews met. Uh, and I think it's interesting that Jesus didn't use that word. A very similar meaning, basically means a gathering together, but a very different connotation. That was the Jewish gathering. And it was, it was the, the ecclesia was still a gathering together, but the ecclesia were the ones who were called out called out to gather together. And the emphasis um, is not so much on the gathering as the ones who are called. And the emphasis being placed back on himself, that he's the one in charge. You know, the synagogue, at the synagogue, there was a leader in charge, and that was sort of where the people gathered together, and, you know, and their... <clears throat> That was sort of the leadership structure in the Jewish um, in the Jewish community, but the ecclesia were those who were called out, who Jesus called them unto Himself. Now people say, well, okay, so we have words like um, you know ecclesiology and the ecclesiastical this, and you know, and so we get how that is the church. But where do we get the word church? Why do we use in English the word church? Um, well, the church was also called the Kuriakon, which was the means of the Lord. So that they were called the people of the Lord. And Kuriakon, being passed down through the ages, uh, eventually got translated in German to be just Kirk, which in English being a Germanic language, got the word church out of the German word for church, which they got from the Greek word kyriakon. So that's why we use the word church. But in the scriptures, when you see the word church, it is translated from, from the Greek ecclesia, which means the called out ones. Now, <clears throat> to define the church, Okay, we're going to look at just a couple of, there's a sort of a brief definition, which is just the community of true believers for all time, and emphasis on the word true, okay? Um, 
what we're going to be talking about here uh, in this class is church with, for the most part, with the big C. The church. The church of Jesus Christ, which is going to be the, the um, true believers in Jesus Christ. Okay? More specifically, the body of people called by God's grace through faith in Christ to glorify Him together by serving Him in this world. It's sort of a more functioning definition, if you will. And again, you know, I'll have all this stuff on the website. You can if you don't, if I change it for you, scribble it down. But the body of people called by God's grace, again, is that calling, ecclesia, through faith in Christ to glorify Him together by serving Him in this world. That's going to be the functioning definition that, that we're going to have. The, the, the point of this is, is that it is people. It's not buildings. You know, we call this, oh, this is, you know, going down to the church. You know, and that's just our colloquialism, but technically, theologically, we are incorrect. We're going down to the church building. We're going down to the property where the church meets. You know, um, we, you know, there's nothing wrong with saying, hey, I'm going down to the church, or I'm going to church today, that's fine. But my point is that when we talk about the church, it's not a building, it's not a property, it's not a place. It is the people. Um, and it's, it's his people. People who he has called out. Um, turn to Acts chapter 2. And we essentially can see the uh, what is generally considered to be the birth of the church. Acts chapter 2, starting at verse 1. When the day of Pentecost had fully come. The interesting thing about the day of Pentecost is called Pentecost because it was 50 days after um, Passover. And uh, it was also a celebration of the early harvest. Excuse me. The early harvest. It wasn't necessarily the first fruit, but it was the first stuff, even before the, the, the first harvest. It was, a, it was sort of an early harvest that would happen where, because this was in the springtime, and, you know, so it wasn't too far into the planting season, but the stuff that came out right away uh, was, was this feast that they had, this feast of Pentecost. Um, so when the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a rushing mighty wind and filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as fire, and one sat upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. That is traditionally considered the birth of the church. The only other point where some people refer to as the birth of the church is in John 20, 22, when Jesus is sitting with them. And he says to them, receive the Holy Spirit. And he breathed on them and they received the Holy Spirit. Um, the important part about both those, those events, and again, this is just sort of, you know, there's nothing in the Bible that says here, this is the birth of the church. You know, again, we are looking at cultural and historical context and lenses when we look at some of this stuff. Um, but... The reason why these two, these two points in Scripture are pointed to as the potential birth of the church is because of the Holy Spirit. There is a, an inseparable connection between the church and the Holy Spirit that, that is, is, is unbroken. Without the Holy Spirit, there is no church. And so <clears throat> there must be, He must be present. <coughs> And, you know, when we get to the second to last class, we're going to see what that role is and why it is, um, it is impossible to have church without the Holy Spirit. And that's one of the reasons why in Calvary Chapel, that symbol that we see, the dove, the descending dove, is there because of the importance of understanding the Holy Spirit. And unfortunately, in a lot of churches today, they have sort of lost that you know, that the Holy Spirit, it's not that they don't believe in the Holy Spirit, but they don't place an emphasis on His ministry in the church and in our lives. 
It's almost like the Holy Spirit is sort of a dormant, oh, he's indwelling, he's in there somewhere, you know. Um, but we believe that the Holy Spirit is active, alive, and crucial to anything that has anything to do with the, with the church. Um, especially in our lives individually. Because as we're going to see later, it is, it is the, the individual relationship that we have with, with God on our own that, that ties together and makes us a community. And the one thing that we all share is we share the Holy Spirit. That same Spirit dwells within each one of us. So that's, that's a very important point. That's why we look at these two points as sort of the, the birth of the church. Now, when we look at the church, there's, there's three what I call manifestations. So when we're talking about the church, there are three different things we could be talking about. Okay? We could be talking about uh, a local church, as in, you know, in these, in these scripture references, these are, this is Paul, both of these saying, to the church in Corinth. And he's talking about a specific church. That's how it is, a church with a little c, if you will. Right? He's just talking to a specific, these gathered together people. He's still talking to the people, but he's talking to that specific local gathering of people in Corinth and in Thessalonians. Uh, and uh, in Revelation, it says the same thing, to the churches in Asia. Speaking of specific churches. Okay, that's the local church. And the word church is used for all three, but we have to understand the context when we, when we do this. Okay? Uh, the church at large. Okay, which is the worldwide church on the earth at this moment. We turn to Hebrews 12, 23. To the general assembly and church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. To God the judge of all, to the spirits of just men made perfect. To the, to the assembly of the church of the firstborn who are registered in heaven. All those on earth that are registered in heaven. We call that the church. The church of Jesus Christ. Lamb's Book of Life. Lamb's Book of Life is this one. Because this is throughout history. This is, the, the, the at large is just those that are here <coughs> at large, on the earth right now, the church as a whole functioning on the earth in this generation at this moment. Now, but we also look at church, when we talk about the church, it goes from Pentecost all the way to the rapture. And that is every believer throughout history. And you know, we're going we're gonna to talk a little bit more about this word. I don't want anybody to get all worked up about this word. We're going we're gonna to explain it a little bit. Catholic, which just means universal, the universal church of Jesus Christ uh, throughout history. And as a matter of fact, turn to Ephesians 3. Because notice it's, it's a small city. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3. And verse 15. From whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. That's, it. That's the whole family. In heaven and on earth. Because the church is not just here. The church is here, functioning. But the church is also in heaven right now. There's a, there's a, a, a representation of the church in heaven. Throughout history. And when we are talking about this, you know, we're talking about visible and invisible. The church is both visible, you know, it is, it is a local uh, assembly that we can go to, we can see, we look at each other, we fellowship with each other, there is a building there that we can touch and experience, um, and then there's an invisible aspect of the church which just exists, and that we still have times. I mean, and we, I'm sure we have all experienced this, where we have been somewhere else, whether it's in this area, or it could be across the country, it could be somewhere else in the world, and we meet somebody who's a believer, and we sense an instant connection. 
there's a familial connection, like we are part of the same family even though we don't know each other. And that is, that is the, the, the invisible aspect of, of the church. Now, <clears throat> it's interesting that we're doing this at the same time that we are going through these three chapters in, in Romans. Because we're hearing Pastor Bill teach us about sort of this transition that happened between Israel and the church. And how while on one hand, uh, the church does not replace Israel in the sense of replacement theology. It, that God is not done with Israel. And so now he says, okay, I'm done with you. Now I'm going to take the church. I'm going to overlay the church on top of Israel. And everything that applies to Israel now applies to the church. No. Church does not replace Israel. However, God has turned his attention from Israel to the church. And it, as far as function, not that God, I mean, God can't turn his attention away from anything. God, God's attention is on everything at all times. I mean, you know what I mean? That in, in the sense of his working in the world, his representation on the earth today is the church. He has taken it from Israel, we're going to read a verse in a minute, that literally says that, and he has given it to, to the church. That being said, the church is not God's plan B. Okay? It was not a, a, an afterthought. Um, God's eternal plan has always been to display his glory, not just through individuals, but through a corporate body. And the Israel even paints a picture for us um, of the church as well. Just that um, we're a distinct body separate from Israel, but we can, you know, we see um, a lot of similarities in God's working with Israel and his approach to Israel and his approach to the church. Um, what we see in what we've been listening in, in the service, um, particularly in Romans 10, Romans 11, uh, is that there was a shift. Okay? And that the church, the church exists in what, what I call a parenthesis. Okay? Um, and I know when I put these, these graphics up, everybody's eyes start rolling up. But, um, <laughs> but bear with me. Try not to get too lost in some of this. Some of this stuff. This is a uh, one of these Clarence Larkin things. Um, I would not call myself a hyper dispensationalist. Okay, there are some people that believe, uh, you know, uh, that there are basically seven different gods. <laughs> that God is different in every different dispensation. Okay, God is not different in every dispensation. The dispensation is just, is, again, just, and there's nothing in the scripture that specifically delineates, but scholars through history have sort of noticed a shift in the way that God works. Okay? And the word dispensation is used in the, in the, uh, the Bible, and it does mention dispensation, and the word is oikonomos. Okay? Two Greek words. <clears throat> House rules. Right? Every dad in the room knows that. This is my house. You follow my rules. Right? <laughs> that's that's oikonomos. Okay? We get the word economy from it. So you can you can substitute the word economy if you want with it that there were different economies throughout history, that God had sort of different rules, uh, not rules of salvation, salvation has always been, you know, uh, by grace through faith, but just in the approach that God takes in introducing himself to that particular people of that dispensation, of that era, okay? And just quickly, this was just the one that I thought described it best, a lot of messy stuff in here that we don't necessarily need. Uh, you know, age of innocence before the fall, immediately after the fall was conscience. They just, they were held accountable by their own conscience. 
Then there was an age of human government as they began to grow, and there were governments. Um, built the Tower of Babel, that ended that. God began the age of promise, where he found Abraham, gave him a promise, I'll make you a people. Okay, after promise, they entered into the, um, the promised land with the law, and it became the dispensation of law. That went from the time of Moses all the way to the, the time of Jesus. Okay? At the cross, and this is why I call it the, 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 the church a parenthesis, because we have this dispensation of law sort of interrupted by the dispensation of grace or the dispensation of the church, the church age, as it's sometimes called, where God has sort of shifted from Israel and has now turned to the church as his, as his primary function and attention on the earth. And that happens for, all the line happens, up until the rapture, and then the tribulation is sort of a return back to, you know, from my revelation of Daniel class, remember the, the 70 weeks, you know, and we had the, the, um, the 69th 69, 69 week came to right about here, and then it ended. And then we pick up that last week, the 70th week picks up in the seven years of the tribulation. So we sort of see this, it's almost like a, a stopwatch. You know, the time was ticking, we got to the cross, God hit the, hit the stopwatch and paused it. So we have this parenthesis that we call the church age. And we are in sort of this borrowed time. This time for very specific purposes, and we're going to get into those purposes in this class. But the point is that, you know, we, we see in Romans 11 um, that, as Pastor Bill put it, you know, God sort of fired over the head of the Jews. You know, they rejected Jesus Christ, so he said, okay, then I will go to somebody else. And, um, and so we see this sort of parenthesis of this dispensation, and Paul called it a mystery in Ephesians 3, 5 to 6, and Colossians 1, 26, uh, and Romans 16, 25 and 26. He called it a mystery, and a mystery to us, a mystery is something we can't figure out, right? You watch a mystery movie, ah, it's something we can't figure out. Well, mystery is the best translation we can come up with for this word mysterion in the Greek. Mysterion means um, sort of a secret that is now known. Okay? It's almost like an initiation. When you get in the club, now you know it. People outside the club, they don't get it. They don't know it. But now you're in it and you know it. And that was what Paul was talking about when he said it is a mystery. He's not saying, oh, it can't be figured out. He's saying, no, nobody else in me seems to know about it until you're in it. And then once you're in it, you get it. And you understand what it is. And, and, and he saw this, this sort of picture of the shift that God had taken to the church. <clears throat> um, But the story of the church begins with Israel. Okay? The Old Testament people of God. Galatians 6.16 calls the church the Israel of God. And again, we're just learning about this now. What is Israel? Israel means ruled by God. And, and, and Pastor was talking the other day in Romans 10. Not all Israel is Israel. Sounds like a conundrum, doesn't it? Not all Israel is Israel. Well, then who is Israel? Israel, not all of Israel is ruled by God. Is what it's saying. And the church, again, not replacement, but the church is the new Israel, if you will, in that the church is, is the new rule of God. Okay? But in the Old Testament, uh, they were called, in Exodus 4, 22, they were called God's son. In Ezekiel 16, 6 to 14, they were called, this is Israel, was called his spouse. Deuteronomy 32.10, the apple of God's eye. Isaiah 5.1 and Nahum 2.2, 2, the vine. And Ezekiel 34, verse 4, the flock. See, God was working corporately in Israel. So this is not a new concept for God, that he's working corporately. It's just he's working with a different body of people now. He began working with a race um, of people, a family that grew into a race 
uh, and now he is working with a, a faith group. So, uh, and we see in the Old Testament, we see pictures of Christ all over the place, and pictures of the church, the temple, right? The temple uh, is both a picture of Jesus Christ, but it's also a picture of the church. Um, when we think about the courts, you know, and again, not just like coming to church is like going to the temple, but that the temple itself was uh, was a was a place of worship and was a gathering. You know, it, it was a place where the where the presence of God existed, where the Holy Spirit was, and that's that's the picture of the church. So we see this foreshadowing of what of what God would eventually do. So we sort of have these precursors to this. And, uh, and we even have Old Testament words. Um, uh, Ka'al, which is assembly. When you see in the Old Testament, you see the word assembly. It is Ka'al. And there's another word called um, Edah which means like a fixed, a fixed assemblage. And often the word is congregation or assembly. And when, you know, in um, about 100 B.C., the, the Jews decided to translate the Bible into Greek because Hebrew was lost. Greek was the language of the day. They went to 70 scholars in Alexandria, Egypt, and they created what's called the Septuagint. So you can remember... Have you heard of what the Septuagint is? Have you heard of the Septuagint? Didn't know what it meant. Septuagint just means 70. Because at least 70 scholars who got together, translated the Old Testament into Greek. Now, this, these words, kahal and uh, eda, are translated into the Greek as ecclesia. Called out ones. The ones gathered together. So, we... We see this picture of the church in the Old Testament. It's not plan B. God knew it was coming. God was um, sort of getting them ready for the coming of the church. Okay. Um, <clears throat> Israel was called to be a servant, but they were not faithful. And again, we, you know, Romans 11. We, we see how um, God sort of went around them. Now, we look at Christ's work as the foundation, and uh, and His work is continued in the church. So we're now we're looking at uh, the nature of, of, of the, the function of the church. That His work, what what Christ did, is, is the foundation of of the church. But it's also our work. It's our we continue. You know, his point was, go go pick up where I left off. He told his disciples, you'll do greater things than I have, than I have even done. You know, um, pick up the ministry and take it on. You know, the church was founded by Christ, as we read. It was purchased by his blood. We are his body. You know, 1 Corinthians uh, 12, 12, and 27. Ephesians 1, 22, and 23. I mean... You just look up the word, the, the phrase "body of Christ" in, in the scriptures, and you know, it's all throughout there. That we are, and, we, and the picture that that paints—what is it? We are His physical body. We're His hands and feet. Jesus goes where we go, and we take Him with us. We're a dwelling place for the Holy Spirit. We're <coughs> an instrument for bringing forth the gospel. Uh, <clears throat> you know, Paul had. Two revelations, two earth shattering revelations. And turn to Galatians 1. Something that was given to Paul that was not specifically given to the other apostles. Not that they didn't understand it. Galatians 1. 11 and 12. But I make known to you, brethren, that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to man. For I neither received it from man, nor was I taught it, 
but it came to me through the revelation of Jesus Christ. This gospel of grace, this gospel of what some call the finished work, is, was a revelation to Paul. It was given to him by Jesus Christ directly. It wasn't something that the other apostles taught him from the teachings that they received from Jesus. This was something he received directly. And there was one more. If you turn to Ephesians 3. <clears throat> Verse 1. For this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation of grace, is that word dispensation, if you have heard of the dispensation of grace of God, which was given to me for you, how that by revelation he made known to me the mystery, as I have briefly written already, by which when you read, you may understand my knowledge and the mystery of Christ, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men, as has now been revealed by the Spirit of his holy apostles and prophets. That, what, is this, what is this mystery he's talking about? That the Gentiles should be fellow heirs of the same body and partakers of his promise in Christ through the gospel. And that's, that's the revelation that, that, that Paul received about the church, about the gathering together. That we would, that, you know, because at that time the only church was the Jews. And he's saying, this is not just going to be the Jews, this is going to be everybody. Everybody's in on this. It's a new thing. It's a mystery. It's a secret that has been revealed. You know? And the, the point of this was also through the gospel. That the church arises from the gospel. That and, and a distorted gospel will create a distorted church. If you see a church that's got some kind of distortion, there's something going on there... You listen to the gospel that they preach, and you're going to find that they have a distorted gospel. Because it's the basis, it's the, it's the foundation of the, um, of the church is, is the gospel. Um, and what often happens is numbers becomes the priority. How many people? How many people you got coming out? How many? You have no idea. You know, people I talk to, and I tell them I'm a pastor in the church. And, oh, well, how many are there? You do the first thing, well, how many go to your church? You know, everybody wants to know numbers. That's 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 what success is. Um, but when numbers become the priority, the truth is going to become compromised. Because the time will come when you have to say something unpopular. You know, and we've we've experienced. It. I mean, sometimes things come up, and uh, issues in the scripture need to be addressed. Politically, they're very unpopular, but we're going to teach it because it comes up, and we're going to and some people. Say, oh, I don't know, I don't, I don't believe that, and they and they, they leave the church because they don't want they, they 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 disagree with that. Well, there are some churches that would say, well, let's just soften the message so we don't have to. Do we have to say those things? People will stay, and they'll be here to hear the gospel if they stay. You know that that's where we start to compromise. Yeah, you can get watered down exactly. You know. Success is not in numbers, but in the fidelity of the scriptures. You know, so the church is, you know, the, the, the key is the gospel. Preserving what is the gospel? The word of God. And the church is the gospel made visible. Um, Mark Deaver has a great line. He says, Christians proclaiming makes the gospel audible. But Christians living together in a local congregation makes the gospel visible. In John 13, 34, he says, this is my commandment that I have for you, that you love one another. And he says, the world will know that I have sent you because you love one another. You know, it is that community, you know, because when people come into a church, they're looking for, you know, genuineness. They're looking for um, unity. They're looking for people that genuinely love one another, that there is a community going on. You know, not a bunch of robots that punch a clock every Sunday morning. Um, and, and there needs to be life in the church. Now, <clears throat> we're going to try to zip through because we're starting to get a little bit late. Uh, pictures of the church. Pictures of the church. Okay. 
this, this all, I mean, there's no one picture that can capture all aspects of the church. So we see many, many, many pictures being drawn of the church. Um, uh, a herald, an obedient servant, a bride, uh, a building, a temple, salt, in Matthew 5, right? Uh, and a letter or an epistle in 2 Corinthians 3, that you are an epistle, uh, and the family of God. There are some bigger pictures that we see. Uh, one is that we are a people of God, just like Israel. Again, there's sort of that parallel. We are the people of God. Uh, 2 Peter 2. Let's turn real quickly to 2 Peter 2. Again, a passage I'm sure we're all very... 1 Peter 2, I'm sorry. 1 Peter 2, 9 and 10. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, his own special people that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness, there's that calling, into his marvelous light, who once were not a people, but are now the people of God, who, have not, who had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Um, you know, we are, we are like, again, we are the Israel of God. We are the people of God. We are the seed of Abraham in, in Galatians 3.29. Right? The next picture is that of a new creation. You know, 2 Corinthians 5. 17. That individually we are a new creation, right? Uh, you know, um, that in Christ all things are made new. That we are um, we are made a new creation, and that <clears throat> it's not just true individually, but it's true corporate. You see, in 1 Corinthians 15, 20, it talks about the first fruit of the resurrection, a new beginning, a new creation, uh, in a corporate sense. Even that the church itself is a new creation. It's something that never existed. Like we, we've been reading. It's a mystery. <clears throat> and then we also see that it is a fellowship. Right? 1 Corinthians 1 2. We're set apart for God's purpose together. It says we're sanctified. The church uh, in, in Corinth is what he says sanctified unto God. We, you read the book of Acts, particularly in, in, in chapter 2. Common life. They had all things in common, right? They were selling their things and giving them to one another. Nobody had anything of their own personal property back then uh, in the early church because they, they gave to another. They had, they had a, common, um, a common life together. Uh, Luke 12, 4 and John 15, 15. A shared status as followers, disciples, and friends of Jesus Christ. We have a covenantal union with Christ. And <clears throat> we, together, we live, we suffer, we're crucified, we die, we are raised, we're glorified with Christ. Again, in, in fellowship with one another. Um, next picture is that of the body of Christ. We talked about it a little bit. You know, in 1 Corinthians 10, 17, we who are many are of one loaf, Paul says. And then in 1 Corinthians 12, it, all, it talks about the diversity of the body. There are many members, but there's one body. Each member in particular, but one body as a whole. Ephesians 3, we just read about the Jew and the Gentile. The, Jew, the Gentile being brought in to the, to the Jewish covenant, if you will. The, the Christian Jews, um, that it's all one body. There's not going to be Jewish Christians over here and Gentile Christians over here. That's why I'm not a big fan of like the Messianic temples. I mean, I'm, I'm grateful, I'm blessed that they're born again, um, but they they separate themselves out from other Christians and they have sort of a almost like a, a Jewish temple experience in you know, but they're Christians. You know, uh, they are saved, but they sort of separate themselves out, and um, and that's not what what the scripture tells us. It's, it's, it's all one body, Jew, Gentile, every race and creed and, and whatnot. Um, it's interesting in Acts nine four, Jesus tells Paul, 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 why do you persecute me? Why did he say you're persecuted? He wasn't persecuting Jesus. He was persecuting the 
church. Well, the church is Christ's body. So he was persecuting Jesus personally. Okay? Um, and again, like we said, the, the idea that, that the church is the body of Christ is it just speaks to the functionality of what we're doing. You know, I look at we look at our 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 being. We are body, soul, and spirit. I don't see your soul, I don't see your spirit. All I see is your body. I see what you look like and I see the things that you do. And when people look to Jesus Christ, they don't see him, they don't see the Holy Spirit, they see the church. Because we're the body of Jesus Christ. They see what we look like and they see the things that we do. And, and the things that we do need to be reflective of Jesus Christ. You know, we, uh, generally, as a rule, our body doesn't do things that our that our brain doesn't tell it to do. Um, you know, we, the, the two work in unison. That the head tells the body to do something, and the body does it. And it should be the same with the body of Christ. When the head tells the body to do something, there should be no distinction between what the body does and who the head is. So that's the, the picture of the body. And then the final picture is that of the kingdom of God. And <clears throat> I didn't put any scriptures because just all throughout the Gospels, Jesus is saying, you know, the kingdom of God is like this. The kingdom of God is like this. And the kingdom of God, and what is he talking about? Okay. And when John came, says so John came saying the kingdom of God is near. Okay. And that word near is interesting because it means... Present and not yet. It's a Greek word that means here, but not yet here. Uh, like at hand is sometimes the word that, that's used. Kingdom of God is at hand. Like it, there it is, but it's not yet also. And so we look at the kingdom of God, and we often think, we think the kingdom of God, we think of heaven. Or we think of the millennial kingdom. And that's fine. The millennial kingdom is the kingdom of God. It is the kingdom of Jesus Christ. You know, heaven is the kingdom of God. But the kingdom of God on earth is the church. Because what is the kingdom of God but the rulership, the rule of God? Right? His kingship, his kingdom. He's the king. Where is his kingdom? On earth. It's the church. Nobody else is going to obey him. There's nobody else on earth that's good that can obey Jesus Christ but the church through the Holy Spirit. You know, in Matthew 6, he said, pray this, you know, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Right? Your kingdom come on the earth, not just in the millennial reign, but on the earth today. Where is the kingdom of God? His kingdom is here in that his will is being done through his people. <clears throat> you know, the kingdom rests on the church. It's the recognition of God's authority on the earth. And here's that verse in Matthew 21. This is both a statement of who the kingdom is and also a statement of the, the, the transition. In Matthew 21, verse 33. Basically, I'm not sure if I get the chapter wrong or where it is. Is it 20? Just a uh, what Jesus tells them, he says, he said that the kingdom is going to be taken from you and given to another. And you know, that's both speaking of what we've been talking about in Romans, in Romans chapters 9 through 11, but also that the church has become the kingdom. Uh, this, is, this is where the, the ruling um, power, 
the, uh, and, and even in Matthew 16, the next verse after verse 18, he says, I give you the keys, right? Which is the, the, the power uh, of the kingdom has been entrusted to the church. The recognition of <clears throat> God's authority on the earth. Now, the last thing we're going to talk about are the attributes. Real quickly here. In 381 AD, there was a council. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the councils tomorrow night. But in 381, there was a council in Constantinople, Istanbul today, right? Um, and at these councils, when they were done, what these councils did, there was a council of Carthage, there was a council of Nicaea, there was a council of Alexander, there were a million councils. <clears throat> what they would do at the end of this council, once they sort of hashed out some theological point, they would write a creed. And they would usually just take the Nicene Creed. Prior to the Nicene Creed was the Apostles' Creed. And uh, before they had any council, they had the Apostles' Creed which was, you know, I believe in God the Father, Almighty Heaven, Maker of Heaven and Earth, and you know, most of you know it. Um, uh, or at least, it was a very stripped down version of it, it was the Apostles' Creed. Nicene Creed added to it to try to bring clarification to the deity of Christ, because that was an issue in the Nicene Creed. And as these different councils got together, whatever issue they sort of hammered out, they found a way to sandwich it in to the... Um, to their creed at the end. One of the things that came out of the Council of Constantinople was we believe in one holy, universal, apostolic church. Okay? And these are the attributes that they found in searching the scriptures uh, for the church. Um, when we look at these, th these four attributes, one, holy, universal, and apostolic, in, in Acts 4.32... Acts 4.32, which is great because there is no 32. <coughs> I'll check my verses better. Did you say Acts 4.32? Yeah. What's that? Acts 4.32. There is a 32 in Acts 4. There's no... Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? My Bible just breaks it off. I thought it was the next chapter. Now the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but he had all things in common. So there was, there was a unity. Okay? And there's also a unity, you know, God designs these things and, you know, we are created in His image in that unity in diversity. The Trinity is a picture of unity. Now, unity does not mean, when we say one, right, it's almost like when we hear Pastor Bill talk about in Deuteronomy 6, the, the Shema, when it says, you know, uh, the Lord our God, the Lord our God is one. Echad is the word for one. It means like, hey, we're all one on this, right? We're all one together on this. It's a, it's a, a unity in a plurality. So when we say the church is one, there is a unity. There is one church. There is one universal church of Jesus Christ. We are united in the Holy Spirit. We are united in, in baptism, not in water baptism, but in baptism um, through the Holy Spirit, uh, we are one in Christ. Even if we differ, even if we don't get along, we're still one. If we're part of the, the body of Christ, if we are, we uh, have a unity in a plurality. And that's what that's speaking of. Um, second attribute: we are holy. First Corinthians one one two. Again, same verse we talked about earlier. He talked to the Corinthian church and said, "You are sanctified. You are set apart." We are holy because He is holy. Set apart in service to Him. 
And when we think of holy, the word uh, holy, hagios in the Greek, means set apart. Okay, set apart for a specific purpose, something very special. <clears throat> but I don't, and when we think of that, I don't ever want to lose the aspect of, of holiness speaking of cleanliness, of, of righteousness. That when we say God is holy, it's not just that He's, you know, He's set apart uh, and He's just so much better than us. We say God is holy, it means God is holy with a W, other. He is something completely different. He is something so completely different from us that we almost can't even comprehend the, 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 um, the chasm that is between us. Okay? And so when we are in the church, the, the, you know, the thing that Jesus said to the Father in his prayer in John 17, he says, I don't, say, I don't ask you to take them out of the world, but that you would sanctify them by your word. Right? I, I need them in it, but I need them to be different. I need them to be in it, but not of it. I want them to be wholly other. That's sometimes that's, that's the, the emphasis in that word, holy, um, is, is not just put over here, but put over here because you're something completely different. You live by a different economy. You live by a different set of rules. You live by a different you know, set of priorities. And so when we are holy, when the church is holy, the church has to stand out. Something that is that different. You know, remember that game we used to play as a kid? One of these things is not like the other. You know, it used to be a challenge. It was, well, if you got like three frogs and a cow, okay, <laughs> how hard is it to figure out which one is not like the other? Well, we want to be like that. We don't want to be like, you know, there's three, three frogs with four freckles and there's one frog with three freckles. No, we want to be the cow. We want to be the one that's like, wow, that's, okay, that's easy. That's very different. So when we talk about the, the church being holy, that's what we mean. Holy with a W, other, something different. It stands out, set apart, uh, but not seclusionist. We're not, we're not here to, you know, to live in a, in a, a little, you know, enclave, like a hermit. No, I don't, I don't go out and associate with people. I'm holy. You, know, you, need, to be, you need to be different among them. So that's the, that's the holy that we're talking about. And then we talk about universal. Okay? There's that word Catholic again. When you read these creeds, that's what you're going to see. It says one holy, usually it says one holy Catholic church. With a small c. That word Catholic just means universal. It means he is the Lord of all the earth. He's not just the Lord of Americans. You know, he's not just the Lord of Anglo-Saxons or... You know, he is the Lord of all the earth, the Lord of all the ages, of all cultures, languages, peoples. There's no restrictions. No, no one group possesses salvation, nor possesses all the doctrines. You know, if, if you know me well, you know I say this often, that when, when we get up there, we're all going to find out that none of us had it all right. None of us had it all down pat. You know, um... We are not exclusive possessors of anything more special than anybody else. We're just, our job is just to teach the Word of God as best as the Holy Spirit leads us how and not worry about anybody else. And we're one with them. You know? And we, and we lay, I mean, there are some people that we, you know, I was at a um, sort of ecumenical meeting, if you will, uh, with the, 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 the village of Estero, they were they wanted to meet with some of the churches. And um, I don't know how many here know Nolan from um, Legacy Church. Anybody know Nolan? Well, if you've met him, you'd know him. He's just, Bill calls him, he's the, stir, he's the straw that stirs the drink. He's just kind of a real personality. So he, he sort of convened this meeting with uh, one of the selectmen or one of the council members over in the village of Estero. And there was about 10 or 12 of us there, and there was, uh, you know, somebody from Summit was there, and I was there for here, and uh, uh, 
Nolan had his guy. There was somebody from First Baptist. There was somebody from, I think, a Presbyterian church. There was um, even a deacon from the Catholic church was there. And Nolan was telling the guy, he says, well, he says, we didn't, you know, we invited all the churches that did come. Not everybody could make it, but we invited all the churches. And he said this series, he wasn't trying to be joking around, he says, well, we didn't, you know, we didn't invite the Mormon church. Because we're just, you know, we're just sort of trying to stick with the traditional Christian churches. So, because there's universality in that. A church that doesn't put Jesus Christ as, you know, Lord and creator of the universe is not part of the universal body of Christ. You know, uh, so, you know, when I talk about the universal church, it is all, just like we said, all the believers in the true you know, all true believers in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, no matter where they are. So it's universal. Uh, and then lastly, apostolic. This is not, I'm not talking about apostolic succession. No. Go run on the pastor bill and <laughs> tell them I'm teaching all kinds of weird stuff. When they say apostolic, is when this was written, that whole idea of Peter being the first pope didn't exist in, in, in 381 A.D. <clears throat> um, when they said apostolic, they mean that the, the foundation of the church came through the apostles. It didn't come from somebody else over here saying, oh, we're going to... No, well, where's the, where's the lineage of your, of your pedigree, if you will? The sent, from the sent out ones, apostolic, apostoleto in the Greek, which means ones who are sent out. Sent out from Jesus. You know, there was, there was an important point in the book of Acts. We see them being referred to as 12, even though they really weren't 12. It was actually more like 13. You know, I mean, it was originally 11, because Judas wasn't really part of the 12, but they still called them the 12, because they've been called the 12 for three years. So even after Judas left, they still called them the 12. And they added Matthias, making them 12 again. And then Paul was in there, uh, and there's even one point where I think Barnabas is, being, is called an apostle. So that's not even, the, the, the point isn't even that, oh, it's the 12, how many apostles? It's that these were men who were sent by Jesus Christ. They were called and sent by Jesus Christ. They were commissioned by the Lord himself to start the church. And, and, and he, what's that? Established doctrine. Established doctrine. Exactly. And that was, you know, and we're going to see, talk more about that later in the class, is, you know, what did they, you know, they were, they were gathered together. They, the, the, one of the chief activity was the apostles' doctrine. I think it's interesting that it doesn't say Jesus' doctrine. It says the apostles' doctrine because they were authoritative. They had the authority of Jesus Christ upon them. They were sent out personally by him to teach, like Paul, being given revelation, to teach the Word of God, to write the Word of God. Right? They had, they had revelation from Jesus Christ. The church is founded on the Word of God. Where did the Word of God come from? It came through the lips of the apostles. It was the Word of God given to the apostles. In John 17, when Jesus was praying in verse 20, he said, I pray for those who will believe through you, through them. He was praying for us because we're the ones who would believe through his apostles. You know, and that when we say that the church is apostolic, we just mean this, this, there, um, particularly at this time, and we're so close to it. I mean, the apostle was for us to trace the lineage. But, but the point being that, for example, we go back to the book of Acts. That is, that is sort of our authority on the function of the, and the, and the reality of the church. We look to the book of Acts. We look to the apostles' doctrines. We look to what the, the apostles gave us. Somebody who comes up with some Gnostic gospel, some gospel that was written 300 years later. Oh, this has got authority too. No, was it written by an apostle? Oh, well, we don't know. 300 years later, it's got an apostle's name on it. You know, Thomas or Judas or whatever. Uh, well, it didn't come from the apostles. And that was, you know, when they sat down <clears throat> at Nicaea and Constantinople and Carthage and all these different councils and started hammering out 
the scriptures, they weren't they weren't sitting there going, hey, anybody else got scriptures that we can add? These were books that were already in existence. And they were already circulating. They were already there in front of them. And they were examining them and saying, okay, which ones came from the apostles? Which ones came from people who were sent out by Jesus Christ? That gave them authority. If it wasn't written by somebody who was sent out by Jesus Christ, it was not considered scripture. It didn't have the authority. It didn't have the canonicity. It didn't pass the test. You know, it was written by a great guy. Let's just say it was written by, um, uh, you know, Tertullian, or written by um, Polycarp, who was a, uh, a disciple of the Apostle John. It be, could be a great book, but it wasn't written by an apostle. It wasn't written by somebody sent out by Jesus Christ. I was going to say, uh, I think they, had, they came across that with the Shepherd of Hermas. That I think it was written by, was it written by Polycarp? But they were considering uh, whether to add it to the canon, but they didn't because it wasn't written yeah. by. That, I mean, there, uh, I, that specific one I'm not sure, but there were stuff written by church fathers. You know, and even, you know, we have a couple that are, uh, you know, the James, although, again, he's not considered one of the 12 apostles. He was Jesus' brother. He was commissioned by Jesus Jude was Jesus' brother. Mark was an apostle, but Mark basically was writing the gospel according to Peter. To be perfectly honest with you, Mark was a, was a disciple of Peter, the apostle Peter. So when we, although it was written by Mark, it was it was uh, the, the story was given by Peter, so it had apostolic uh, authority to it. You know, and we, we read these these we look at these books. If they don't have apostolic authority, we don't accept it. And just like a church, if a church doesn't have its basis in the apostolic authority, then we reject it. First God. That's why you have. Uh, that's why Galatians one eight, and that's why you've got the Book of Mormon, who was written by you know Joseph Smith through Moroni. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you other than we have preached to you, let him be accursed. Yeah. So there you go. Yeah. What about the book of Luke? Well, Luke, Luke again was, um, I mean, you could say that, that Paul's hand was upon it, and then Luke, Luke wrote it um, sort of as an investigative reporter sitting with the apostles and, and just writing what they, what they said. He was Gentile, correct? Right? He was Gentile. Luke was Gentile, yeah. Was he a first-hand witness? He was not a first-hand witness. Luke was not a first-hand witness. Luke was, was, but he was a doctor and a historian. And what he did is he went and he compiled it together, you know, uh, while he was in ministry with Paul. So, you know, you could, you could say that, you know, sort of like the apostolic authority was there with him and reviewing it and, and compiling it with him. Uh, you know, Paul... Being that one exception, who, while he was an apostle, called personally by Jesus Christ, met on the road of Damascus, was personally called by Jesus Christ, so absolutely an apostle. That's why, you know, in parts of 2 Corinthians, he sort of argues this issue, like, don't say that I'm not an apostle. I am an apostle. I know people, some people don't think I am, but I am. Um, but yet he, he did not walk with Jesus on the earth. So um, Luke was in ministry with Paul. You know, we just read through the book of Acts. He was shoulder to shoulder hit with him, uh, particularly in his final journeys. And um, I think worked with Paul in, in compiling, um, compiling the, uh, the evidence. He just sort of sat down with witnesses and talked to people and got it through the apostles. He sat down with, I'm sure, with Peter and with John and the different apostles uh, to, to get the information. Questions? So, these are, um, again, these are just some of the attributes uh, delineated. I mean, there's lots of attributes that we can give. These, I think, are just important. They were, they were outlined in this, um, in this council. I think they sort of sum things up for us uh, with regard to the church. So, next week, 
as I said, we're going we're to go through a history of the church. It's going to be a little bit of a whirlwind. We're going to go through it pretty quick. Um, and, um, and just look at uh, from Pentecost to present. It's, it's kind of a, it's, it's not a pleasant picture, to be honest with you. The history of the church is was kind of an ugly path that the church took. Uh, but I think it's important for us to, uh, to observe. Because one of the things that we're going to uh, talk about are the, the remnants and the revivals that took place even in some of the earliest times. And how God, I think the, the miracle that we witness in the history of the church is how God somehow managed to maintain it. And that the church still exists today. Uh, if it was any other institution, it would not exist today. You know, things, things tend not to wind up. Things tend to wind down. You know, what's the, the uh, second law of thermodynamics, right? You, you, it, it, in, order to keep, in order for things to get better, in order for, for things to uh, improve, energy has to be added to it. Uh, when it's, a, it's like when Gamaliel gave advice to the, to the, uh, the Jew back in the book of Acts. He said, leave it alone. If it's a man, it'll die. It'll wind down. If it's of God, you won't be able to stop it and you'll find yourself fighting God. Yeah. And it's interesting to watch the history of the church sort of take a very tortured path. And some of those were pretty deep dips, you know, and that we see today that there are churches, not just us, the I <coughs> You know, I consider us a healthy church. Uh, but there are a lot of healthy churches out there. There's a lot of unhealthy churches out there. But there was a time in history when there was not a lot of health in the church. <laughs> there, was, there was a lot of corruption, a lot of mess. And the fact that the church would come back, would rally from that, uh, is, is a testament to the, to the Holy Spirit for being the one that is infusing energy into the church to bring it back from, uh, from the death throes. So we're going to talk about that next week. Any questions? Okay, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word. We thank you for the gift of the church and what it means and uh, what its functions are and that we are a part of it, Lord, and that we are the church. Uh, we have a place in it. Father, help us through this class not only understand that we are the church, but also what, uh, what that means for our lives and, and how that should affect us and, and the decisions that we make and how we conduct our lives. So, Father, we uh, just thank you again for this time. I ask now that you would uh, just bless us as we go. In Jesus' name we pray.